Paulus sent an apology to Hitler for having suggested that the 6th Army should surrender. He said that the 6th Army would carry out its orders, which meant die in place. And so, the advance continued on the 23rd of January 1943, compelling the German remnants to fall back even further. The 14th Panzer Division retreated to the airfield at Gumrak, with elements from the 44th Infantry Division. There were only a few panzers left in this so-called Panzer Division, which only had around 80 combat troops left at this point, who had only rifles, hand grenades and machine guns to defend the place with, since they had no artillery or anti-tank guns. Not that it mattered, since the Luftwaffe failed to show up at all today, delivering no supplies. The fact was that, no matter how well his troops defended themselves, the lack of ammunition and food condemned Paulus's army to certain death. But Paulus did the best with what he had. Overnight to the 24th of January, he shifted forces around from the 24th Panzer, 60th Motorized, and Romanian 1st Cavalry Divisions to try and salvage the situation in the north, but it was a hopeless task. German resistance remained fierce as they fell back over the course of the day, yet there was no way of stopping Gumrak falling to the Soviet 21st Army. Many accounts say the airfield fell on the 23rd, but the airfield wasn't operational on the 23rd, and then the Soviets only took the area on the 24th, which accounts for the confusion. At Gumrak, the Russians found heaps of hard-frozen German soldiers' corpses that had been carried out on stretchers or planks from the House of the Dying. Themselves weak, the medical orderlies no longer wanted to hack out graves for the dead in the hard-frozen ground, and there were no more explosives available. With Gumrak gone, the only airfield left was the one at Stalingradsky, which was completely inadequate for what was required. Worse, planes had been landing at Stalingradsky over the past few days, most of them crashing upon doing so, as the ruined runway was too short. Not that it would matter anyway, because the Soviets were approaching now. The last aircraft took off from the Stalingradsky airfield, taking some casualties and one Croatian legionary with them, but most of the wounded remained. The Germans had left the wounded behind at the airfield's medical collection point, which was then overrun by the Soviets just hours after Gumrak fell. Hapt says that none of them were even heard of again, and implies that they were all murdered by the Soviets. That's not necessarily the case, though. Most of the soldiers captured from this point onwards were on the brink of starvation anyway, and as we'll see, most of the healthy men didn't survive. But this was it. There were no more airfields, meaning that Paulus could only receive a handful of supplies via canister, and nobody could be brought in or out of the pocket. The remaining wounded had no chance, and neither did the remnants of Paulus's army. The airlift had officially failed, and 6th Army was doomed. A veterinarian made a heart-rending decision about his horse, Law. Forced out of a balka towards the city, Herbert Wrench went to the Black Mare, led her into a tunnelled-out bunker, and tied her to a post. As Law stood patiently beside her master, Wrench patted her neck and gently stroked her emaciated flanks. When she turned her head to nuzzle his hand for food, he choked back a sob and ran away. His one hope was that the Russians would find her quickly and treat her with tenderness. Chirikov tried, but achieved no gains in the city, and decided to just sit on the defensive now, and wait for the other armies to reach him. As Glantz explains, this was an admission that the 62nd Army was still incredibly weak after all the previous fighting, and wasn't much better off than the German 51st Army Corps. That said, the 57th and 64th Armies had reached the southern suburbs of the city and had taken part of the Minina suburb by the end of the day. So it's not like Churikov really needed to keep attacking at this point, as the other armies were close now. On the 24th of January, Jaeger Regiment 54 even had two Russian deserters come in. They believed that they were surrounded, not the Germans, because their propaganda had constantly lied to them in the past. Hitler refused another request by Paulus to surrender, even though the 6th Army Command had effectively lost control of their forces. In fact, Paulus reported that five of his divisions had been destroyed, one being wiped out prior to Operation Ring. 
They did report that the Romanian troops that they had were fighting fiercely, standing shoulder to shoulder with their German comrades. And they also reported that their wounded weren't being cared for, and all of them were starving. The patients received only one thin slice of stale bread per day. The doctors turned this into a sort of soup, which was hot and made it go a little further. 3,000 wounded lay dying in the tunnels of the Tsarets of Balka, not necessarily of their wounds, but of typhus. Typhus started to spread among the wounded and the healthy, affecting 90% of the men by the time they entered the Soviet prisoner of war camps. This was especially bad since hardly any had been inoculated, and they didn't receive medical treatment during the siege. Put a pin in this because typhus will become an important factor in the aftermath of the battle. Unfortunately, on the 25th of January 1943, the 6th Army was unable to supply the Romanians with any rations at all, which would have devastating consequences on the next day. But for now, they continued to fight as the Soviets pushed on once more. In the north, the Germans still offered organised resistance, and it was decided to abandon Orlovka to the Soviets. Elsewhere, though, the Germans were basically routed as the chain of command and the units themselves broke apart. The 6th Army even lost communication with the 8th and 11th Army Corps, as well as the 14th Panzer Corps. These were thrown back in disorder through the hills west of the city centre. The 371st Infantry Division was hit on three sides and forced to withdraw across the Elshanka River and railway line into the southern streets of Stalingrad. The suburbs of Yelshanka, Minina, and Koporoznoi all fell to the Soviets by the end of the day. 3rd Motorized Division was offered surrender talks, but turned them down. And really, the only force in 6th Army that hadn't collapsed was Zylitz's 51st Army Corps, as Chubikov's forces didn't attack on this day. The 6th Army announced, the swastika flag is on the highest building of the inner city area, and the last fighting will be led under this symbol. In the apocalyptic conditions of the final weeks of January, the declaration of 6th Army Command and of individual commanders for the Fuhrer and the Swastika were merely bizarre attempts to lend meaning to what had lost all meaning. Paulus probably still had around 100,000 men left at this point, 22,000 of which were wounded, with another 20,000 frostbitten. Yes, almost half his army was incapacitated. There still remained several thousand Romanians and Russian Hiwis, and everyone was now crammed into, well, this one map, which is only a few miles in length. The state of the 6th Army at this point was disastrous. In general, there were no more experienced infantrymen. Equipment consisted solely of rifles and machine guns. Several positions did have an anti-tank gun, but these did not have sufficient ammunition. Some men were taking matters into their own hands, in what Colonel Adam describes as an epidemic of self-deletion. Often, this was done with pistols placed to their temples, but several commanders approached their doctors asking for poison. On the operating table, we had to scrape lice off uniforms and skin with a spatula and throw them into the fire. We also had to remove them from eyebrows and beards, where they were clustered like grapes. With the last hours at hand, wounded German soldiers in countless cellars asked for pistols. The lice that had lived on them for weeks quickly left the cooling bodies and moved like grey blankets to other beds. It was on this day that Manstein issued a gag order to stop people from discussing why the 6th Army had been abandoned to its fate. He didn't want anyone to blame him for the disaster. Stalin, on the other hand, congratulated his troops, telling them that, in a period of two to three months, they had advanced 400 kilometers, liberated numerous towns and cities, destroyed 102 Axis divisions, and had taken 200,000 prisoners. This truly was a stunning, if not hard-won, victory for the Soviets. But one city still remained to be taken. Stalingrad. Rokossovsky prepared for the final task. 
He understood that Paulus was out of ammunition at this point, and so decided that the best course of action was to link up with Chuikov, split the pocket in two, and then deal with the two Axis pockets separately. Chuikov would need to actually attack, though, which was unfortunate given the weakened state of his forces. But Rokossovsky decided to launch his attack without any artillery preparation, which he hoped would give him the element of surprise. In reality, it didn't matter at this point whether the Germans were surprised or not, since they were in ruin anyway, but the tactic may have actually helped in some way. And on this evening, Zeilitz tried to convince Paulus to give in and surrender. Paulus, though, refused. Apparently, Paulus' tick on the right side of his face now extended from his jaw to his eyebrow. And the impression from the officers was that Paulus was no longer really in charge, having sunk into a deep depression. His chief of staff, Arthur Schmidt, was supposedly the one pulling the strings. The only problem is that we do have evidence that Paulus was making decisions, so this view should be taken with a grain of salt. Despite the fact that the 6th Army was on the brink, Milch hadn't given up and threatened his wavering airmen with death if they didn't fly. As a result, 100 tons of supplies were airdropped into Stalingrad. This was held by Major Freudenfeld, who had successfully set up a marked drop zone in the southern part of Stalingrad. Now, though, resistance made no sense to the troops, which is why so many were giving up. However, Paulus understood the strategic situation and knew he had to give the main front time to save itself. Paulus was thinking of Germany and his Führer. And yet, his Führer had already moved on. It was on this day that Hitler gave the order to make a second new 6th Army with 20 fresh divisions reconstituted from the old ones, even though still fighting. Depending on your interpretation, this either confirms that he was heartless and had given up on the army Paulus was commanding, or he was being pragmatic, since there was nothing he could do to save them now. Let me know what you think. And on the 26th of January 1943, a Soviet force consisting of two Guards Rifle Divisions, two Heavy Guards Tank Regiments, and the 121st Tank Regiment were ordered to strike east and link up with Churikov's forces in the region of the Red October Village, namely with the 13th Guards and 284th Rifle Divisions. In the initial artillery bombardment, Powell's headquarters came under fire, and he and Colonel Adam were sprayed with glass and other debris. Both Adam and Powell's were bleeding from their heads, but survived, and then received news that General Dreber had surrendered his division the day before. They also learned that General Stempel of the 371st Infantry Division had taken his own life after hearing that his own son, a lieutenant, was killed elsewhere in Stalingrad. At dawn, the Soviets struck. The 44th, 76th and 113th Infantry Divisions had no chance of stopping them, and as a result of not receiving rations, discipline could no longer be maintained in the Romanian 82nd Regiment. Thus, it routed, and the Germans once again blamed the Romanian cowardice for this disaster. Realistically though, at this point, there's no way that a German force, fed or not, could have stood up against two guards divisions and 21 KV tanks, so blaming the Romanians here seems unfair. In fact, the 16th Panzer Division reported that 100th Jaeger Division had also collapsed, with the men so exhausted that they even abandoned their machine guns. At around 10.00 hours, the link-up with the 13th Guards Rifle Division occurred, with 51st Guards Division's 216th Regiment reaching the forward positions of the 13th Guards Division's 42nd Regiment. It had been 138 days since the 62nd Army had been trapped inside Stalingrad, and so celebrations followed. But they didn't last long, as there was still work to be done. After about 11.20 hours, after both sides fired off red flares to indicate where friendly lines were, another link-up with the 284th Rifle Division happened with the 52nd Guards Division. Again, celebrations were brief before the action resumed. 
In the south, the fighting continued as the Soviets advanced against fierce German resistance. At 0800 hours, Hartmann stood up in front of the Soviets and fired several rounds from his rifle. It wasn't long before he was shot in the head and instantly killed, in what had been a deliberate act by the general to avoid a dishonourable capture. Fritz Rosker of the 194th Infantry Regiment was promoted to Major General and now took over whatever was left of the 71st Infantry Division. Despite Hartmann's sacrifice, the grain elevator and the nearby train station were taken by the 64th Army. The remnants of the 4th Army Corps, especially the 71st Infantry Division, fought doggedly in house-to-house -house fighting against Hulbukin's and Shumilov's armies, but couldn't stop them reaching the Tsaritsa River by the evening. The 371st Infantry Division managed to hold on to some of the buildings in the south and on both sides of the railroad bridge. However, the 57th Army had managed to cut off the 297th Infantry Division, and that evening Dreber and the remaining 1,880 men of his division surrendered to the 38th Rifle Division. Further north, the Soviets took Olovka and reached the tractor factory village, isolating parts of the 24th Panzer Division in the process, along with parts of the subordinated 94th Infantry Division. Apparently, according to the Germans, the Soviets advanced timidly and hesitantly, which might be because many of the Soviet divisions were fighting at regiment strength at this point, so they didn't have the manpower to waste. The retreat also gave some opportunities to ambush the enemy, and Hull reports that they killed some advanced parties, taking their weapons and some food that they had on them, helping the Germans fight on. Even still, by the evening, 6th Army was split in two, with each pocket containing approximately 50,000 men each, half of whom were wounded. In the Northern Pocket, the majority of the 51st Army Corps and the 11th Army Corps were isolated. And with only one radio capable of communicating with the outside world, a set from the 24th Panzer Division, Corps Commander Karl Strecker took command of the Northern Pocket and wanted to continue the fight. He even reported that the Soviets had tried to start surrender negotiations, and he had sent them away. In the Southern Pocket, portions of 51st Army Corps and elements from other units that had fled this way, including Palace's headquarters, which had just moved to a department store in the centre, were cut off from the forces to the north. Palace was guarded by elements of Roska's 71st Infantry Division, with the remnants of the 4th Army Corps nearby, and the 371st and 295th Infantry Divisions there as well. As we crawled into the department store, there was not a cellar left in the part of the city still occupied by us that was not completely full. The divisional surgeon of the 71st Infantry Division told Paulus that only a fraction of the wounded and sick were getting medical treatment. In most hospitals, it was pitch dark. At best, the doctors and medical orderlies working in the various corners had a few candles or trench lights. Thousands of German refugees had flooded into the city, and the cellars were now overcrowded. And it's worth noting that the German units weren't coherent structures anymore, but often mixed together into ad hoc formations, sometimes leaderless groups, which is why the symbols on the map are now a little more than a rough guide to where the bulk of the men of each force was. Nonetheless, individual German leaders did manage to pull their men together sometimes and keep them fighting, which is noteworthy given the circumstances. There were hardly any guns left, so Paulus now asked the Luftwaffe to just drop food supplies, showing that the priority was now in keeping as many men alive as possible. A theory now made the rounds that it wasn't Paulus who was running the show, but his chief of staff, Arthur Schmidt. Supposedly, Schmidt wanted to continue the fight, whereas nobody else did, so several of the generals decided to meet to discuss the situation. This meeting definitely occurs on the 26th, but there's a problem with it. The generals in question were Zeidlitz, Schlomer, Leyser, Pfeffer, and Du Bois. According to Beaver and Colonel Adam, most of these had given up hope and had apparently lost control of their divisions at this point. They therefore debated asking Paulus if they could surrender. However, this is where William Craig explains that Zeilitz was actually against this, calling it treason. He then grabbed his hat, 
and went to leave, at which point Paulus, who had already heard about this meeting from Schmidt, walked into the meeting. All the sources agree that Paulus refused to allow them to surrender, and ordered them to go back to their units, which they did after a protest about Schmidt's insistence that they continue to fight. The problem is that some sources say that Zeilitz had already ordered his divisions, regiments and battalions to fire off their remaining ammunition and surrender at their own discretion on the 25th, the day before. Well, it makes no sense to be pro-surrender the day before, then to call it treason the next day in the company of a bunch of generals who were pro-surrender as well. Also, it's not clear if these orders ever reached the troops or not, because resistance remained firm in the area for now at least. Paulus also relieved Zylitz of command of his troops on the 26th for ordering his men to surrender. So, with all that in mind, and just thinking logically about this, it would make a lot more sense for things to have happened in this order instead. Zylitz calls a meeting with the generals on the 26th, Schmidt gets wind of it and tells Paulus, and as Zylitz is ordering his men to fire off all their ammunition and surrender at their own discretion, Paulus walks into the room, and it's possible that the generals confront Paulus about Schmidt and the possibility of surrender. Either way, Paulus relieves Zylitz of command, placing Zylitz's divisions under Heights' 8th Army Corps, and the other generals then agree to keep fighting. Paulus is then reported travelling around the pocket, trying to convince his men to continue to resist, suggesting that he sensed the collapse of his army based on the actions of his generals. Clearly, though, he didn't want to surrender, which then goes against the idea that he was just a puppet for Schmidt. Paulus, of course, couldn't prevent individuals and small groups from giving up, especially when they'd run out of food or ammunition. But he was helped by General Heights, who issued an order on this day that any soldiers surrendering or raising the white flag should be shot. So some wanted to surrender, whilst others wanted to keep fighting. With all that said, I am also sceptical of this Paulus being a puppet of Schmidt narrative. Yes, Paulus had joined this in a nervous tick and was probably depressed. Schmidt was also a strong character and was clearly wanting to keep the Sixth Army going. However, it's clear that Paulus was taking action. He was ordering his men to keep fighting, and he refused to surrender, which is evidence pointing away from the conclusion it was Schmidt. Apparently, German soldiers and generals at this time believed that he was a puppet of Schmidt, so there might be a real historical basis for this viewpoint, but just because there were rumours doesn't mean it's true. Therefore, I remain sceptical. To me, and this is a speculative theory, it appears that Schmidt took the fall for Paulus, when in reality Paulus was equally as culpable. The narrative after the war was that the German generals had been innocent, it was all madman Hitler's fault, so Paulus couldn't have been betrayed as a fanatical Nazi willing to fight to the end, since that would go against the idea that the German generals didn't buy into the propaganda. Thus, by making Schmidt the bad guy, not Paulus, this deflects the blame away from the German generals and whitewashes the German army. This may not have been what happened, maybe Paulus was just a puppet, despite the evidence to the contrary, but if anyone is doubting this narrative, like I am, maybe this alternative explanation could fill the gap. Surprisingly, on the 27th of January 1943, the German forces at the Tsaritsa River managed to repel most of the Soviet attempts to cross to the northern bank. Some of Shumilov's forces did get across, but didn't get very far because there were many German units in this area now, making the position a tough nut to crack. Clearing operations continued south of there, though, with small German units continued to hold out inside the ruins and houses and factories. Chistikov's 21st Army advanced slowly over the hills on the Volga's western bank, as Batov's 65th Army struggled against the German positions at the Vishnovia Balka, which formed a perfect anti-tank ditch west of the Barricadi and Red October villages. Apparently, there were even some dug-in T-34s which the Germans were using to repel the Soviets, explaining why they didn't get very far in the north. On their southern flank, though, Baranov's 233rd Rifle Division pushed into the Red October village, 
and soon found itself struggling against heavy German resistance. Zadov's 65th Army also made limited progress, and while Churikov's forces managed to take school number 20, the fighting for the bathhouse didn't go their way at all. After getting some men into it twice, they were forced back both times by German counterattacks. Galanin's 24th Army was ordered to withdraw from the fighting, along with the 49th Rifle Division. The other units of the army were transferred to the 65th and 66th Armies, and several units were withdrawn from the other armies as well, all for rest and refit. This is important because it shows that the Soviets wanted to rely more on artillery and tanks rather than waste infantry fighting a now obvious victory. Though some choose not to believe it, the Soviets didn't have unlimited manpower reserves, and so the aim of the game at this stage was to keep casualties to a minimum, which explains why Rokossovsky allowed his troops to rest several times during the offensive. Armed with the Stavka's clear guidance to conserve manpower, as well as his own keen understanding of how costly it would be to conduct a full-scale infantry assault against German hedgehog defences in the ruined buildings of a rubbled city, Rokossovsky deliberately conducted a slow and methodical reduction operation to avoid as many casualties as possible. It also made sense to pause and take their time, because the Germans were on their last legs. The Soviets knew the Germans weren't receiving anywhere near enough supplies, were starving to death, and were completely exhausted. So, from Rokossovsky's perspective, there was no rush. The Soviets did want to pull troops away from Stalingrad to help out elsewhere, which meant that they couldn't just sit there waiting indefinitely, but they weren't in any hurry to end it. Even at their leisurely pace, the end was drawing near. So the question is, how long could the Germans hold out for? During the night of 27th to 28th of January 1943, Melchinger and five comrades undertook an attempt to break out of the pocket in his panzer. Since then, no sign of life from Melchinger or his five comrades. On the 28th of January 1943, food was now no longer being distributed inside the pocket, making an already catastrophic situation even worse for the Germans. What stockpiled rations remained with the units would no longer be given to the wounded or sick, only to the frontline troops in order to keep them going, which perhaps explains why so few wounded survived the battle. And it still wasn't great for the troops who weren't wounded. Our rations consisted of one and a half loaves of bread for 23 people, one and a half boxes of Choco Cola, and warm broth with a few pieces of horse meat. Then an officer came into Hull's bunker. I was wounded and went to a hospital in Stalingrad. Everything is hopelessly overcrowded there. I was told to look for my units and report myself there, because they had no rations for me. I then set out and asked my way here, but no other unit was able to give me anything to eat. You cannot let me go hungry! A drop site had been established in the northern pocket, along with a radio link, and the Luftwaffe was attempting to send supplies there. But the 6th Army reported it couldn't locate Luftwaffe supply canisters, suggesting that many were either falling behind Soviet lines, or were not being reported to powerless. The wounded were lying in the open, intermixed with the many dead. No one was available to take care of the wounded, and no one had the strength to remove the dead. The surgeons no longer had any medical supplies. At the central military garrison post, 3,000 wounded lay under a merciless wind that whipped through the building's shattered walls. Without enough medicine to care for everyone, doctors placed gravely ill soldiers at the edge of the crowd so that they would die first from the cold. Now, the general situation on the ground gets complicated here. Several sources state that the southern pocket was split in two at this point, or possibly the 27th, and that a third pocket was formed. But none of them state where this third pocket was. The only facts we have is that the third motorized division was split in two, and that the central pocket contained the 8th and 51st Army Corps, even though the 8th Army Corps seems to have originally been in the northern pocket, not the south. Glantz also doesn't mention this third pocket at all, and says something else, which makes zero sense, I'll talk about that in a second. 
Therefore, after spending many hours trying to figure this out and getting nowhere, I'm forced to guess where this central pocket was. So this part of the story and the map regarding the third pocket might not be right. Shumilov's 64th Army remained pinned down at the Tsaritsa, but the 21st Army pushed over the northern part of the Dolgi Ravine and reached the southern part of it, as the 57th Army crossed the Tsaritsa River and advanced into the city. Based on this, and the fact that 3rd Motorized Division got split in two, it would make sense for a pocket to form in the region southwest of Mamiev Kurgan. However, Glenn says that the 15th Guards Rifle Division seized a hospital north of the Tsaritsa and surrounded the headquarters of the 44th Infantry Division in the process. Well, as far as I can tell, 44th Infantry Division wasn't in this area. Perhaps the headquarters was in the south, but the bulk of the division was in the north. Or perhaps Glanz meant the 51st Guards Division had overrun the 44th Infantry Division, which was much further north, but if this was the case, then the third pocket would have been formed from the northern forces, not the southern forces. And honestly, this would make more sense if the third pocket was formed in the north, since the 8th and 51st Army Corps were supposedly in this pocket too. And they were in the north as far as I can tell. So again, I, I have no idea where this third pocket is. But this third pocket idea aside, what is certain is that Reinhard of the 103rd Panzer Battalion attempted a breakout with his own Panzer, probably the last in the battalion. Jason DeMarc says he didn't get very far and was captured. The rest of the battalion seems to have disintegrated, with remnants hiding in cellars, surrendering on this day or the next, and only 12 men from this unit are confirmed to have returned home to Germany after the war. In the north, the 66th Army crossed the Makraya Machetka River and reached the Tractor Factory village. Elements of the 65th Army also crossed the Vizhnovaya Balka and moved into the Barricade village, as Chuikov's forces pushed forward slightly, taking losses in the process. School No. 20 was retaken by Gast's 305th Pioneer Battalion, itself made up of three other Pioneer Battalions, as well as some artillery and musicians. By the end of the day, 100th Jaeger Division was in a slither of territory from Hill 107.5 northwards while barely holding onto parts of the Red October Workers' Settlement. At the Barricade Factory, a storm group from Gorishny's Division took Hall 6E, and fierce counterattacks went in to retake it, resulting in the storm group getting wiped out and the Hall falling back to the Germans. Overnight and into the 29th of January, Seidlitz Kurzbach now openly contemplated taking his own life. His orderly didn't wait and blew himself up with a grenade. And meanwhile, Schmidt was threatening potential deserters with the firing squad. While in private, he asked two officers, one a former Tsarist officer, about their experiences in the Soviet Union, probing them about the treatment they might receive after the surrender. In private, Schmidt's orderly pointed to a suitcase that Schmidt had packed, telling Colonel Adam that the Chief of Staff had prepared himself for capitulation. Also overnight, the headquarters of the 14th Panzer Corps was overrun by a surprise attack. General Schlomer was shot in the thigh and then captured alive not long afterwards. General Du Bois was also captured along with several hundred of his men, and Army Group Don asked 6th Army if it had located the 100 tons of cargo that the Luftwaffe had claimed to have dropped. Although the answer is unknown, the fact that the question was asked indicated the existence of a serious problem. Estimates were that German troops recovered only 50% of these supplies, the Russians got their share too. The 64th, 57th and 21st Armies struck again, this time making decent progress against the collapsing southern pocket. There was an encirclement at the Red Barracks, consisting of remnants of several units, including the survivors of the Croatian Legion. And not long after the advance started, von Daniels made contact with Morozov of the 422nd Rifle Division and offered to surrender himself and his remaining 3,000 men. This was accepted, and von Daniels' 376th Infantry Division disbanded. Also taken prisoner was Lieutenant General Otto Rinaldi, the Chief of Six Army's Medical Services. 
64th Army finally managed to push across the Tsaritsa and move into the buildings north of there, including portions of the flour mill, where Dimitriou's Romanian 82nd Regiment made its final stand. That evening, the Soviets captured Dimitriou's adjutant, and negotiations started with the last cohesive Romanian unit. After the talks stalled, the Soviets threatened to fire their artillery and rockets at them, at which point Dimitriou and his men surrendered. The Romanian resistance at Stalingrad ended just after 9pm that evening, although some Romanian commanders were with Paulus and would surrender at the very end. As a result of the collapse on this day, several staff officers from the 6th Army had been captured, and along with their Romanian prisoners, had revealed the location of Paulus's headquarters at the Univer Mag. Shumilov realised that he was now just 300 metres away from their ultimate prize, prompting him to move Bermakov's 38th Motorised Rifle Brigade between the 36th Guards and 29th Rifle Divisions, and ordering Bermakov to attack towards Palace's headquarters the next day. Surprisingly enough, the Northern Pocket held firm against the 65th and 66th Armies, with the Soviets mainly conducting mopping up operations of German troops behind the lines. This was probably because the Luftwaffe were concentrating on delivering food to the Northern Pocket, as the sources even speak of hot food being delivered to the troops again. 62nd Army did attempt to attack though, and once again made no major progress against the 305th Infantry and 100th Jaeger Divisions, despite the latter being in a precariously exposed position. Ludikov's regiments bled themselves white trying to take the school building, failing to do so. The only exception was Hall 6E again, which the Soviets managed to retake and reinforce with four 45mm guns, allowing them to hold on this time. Hull's area remained largely quiet, although Hull notes that attacks went in either side of him. The men were hungry, again surviving on pitiful rations, but they weren't thinking of surrender just yet. A single tank would have been enough to break our desperate resistance. Instead, our opponent had time and again sent men against us. But a few soldiers still fighting meant nothing at this stage of the battle. A once proud and victorious army continued to hold out, although everyone sensed that the end had arrived. Captain Nikolai Dyatlenka, commander of the Don Front 7th Department, responsible for propaganda and interrogations, decided to talk with the newly captured General von Daniels. Daniels was reluctant to talk at first, but Dyatlenka had an ace up his sleeve. A German transport plane had crashed landed earlier in the month, and von Daniels' letters had been in the plane. Dyatlenka handed them to von Daniels, saying they were his property, and that he should put them in his family archive once he returned after the war. This made von Daniels open up, sharing food and cigarettes with Dyatlenka, and they talked into the night. Many other prisoners didn't need such treatment, and were happy to talk about how Hitler, Goebbels and Goering had betrayed them. The Soviets even concluded that Paulus was under the thumb of Schmidt, his chief of staff, based on the reports of the German interrogations. The Atlenka had no doubt that Schmidt was the eyes and hand of the Nazi party in the 6th Army, because captured officers reported that Schmidt was commanding the army and even Paulus himself. A food canister landed on the last remnants of the now tankless 160th Panzer Battalion, allowing the few remaining men to share bread, sausages and cigarettes. But this was the exception, not the rule, and the men of the battalion prepared themselves to be captured. By this point, it was obvious that the German will to resist in the southern pocket had crumbled. Between the 27th and 29th, Shumilov's 64th Army alone took 15,000 soldiers and officers prisoner. Surrender took on an organised nature. Together with their officers, German soldiers were taken prisoner in large groups, during which their equipment, tanks, artillery and mortars, along with ammunition, remained on the battlefield. However, the story in the northern pocket was different. Rokossovsky believed that Zadov, Batov and Chubikov weren't strong enough to accomplish the task now set before them, and so reinforcements would need to be sent. The southern pocket would, therefore, have to be destroyed first before a major attack on the northern one could go in. At the same time, Tolbukhin's 57th Army, plus other supporting units, 
were ordered to withdraw from the fighting, with the 15th Guards, 38th and 422nd Rifle Divisions, plus the 143rd Rifle Brigade, remaining under Schumel's command until the fighting ended. But otherwise, Tolbukin's army was now out of the picture as well. Knowing that time was running out, Paulus wrote a letter to Hitler congratulating him for the 10th anniversary of his seizure of power. However, for reasons that aren't clear, Paulus wouldn't actually send the message until the 31st of January. He did report twice that the southern pocket was in the process of disintegration, and that many defenseless officers and soldiers were killed in reprisals. Paulus predicted that resistance would collapse on the 30th, but stated that it was possible for Strecker's northern pocket to continue to hold out, noting that the enemy was weaker there. This probably shows that Paulus did have communication with Strecker at this time, something which would become relevant after his surrender. Strecker's 11th Army Corps noted that men were attempting to break out by themselves, giving an example of one truck with 10 men on it who tried to get out. Strecker also said that further attempts weren't possible at the moment because the front wouldn't hold. Individual escapes stood no chance. A few tried, but I have never heard of anyone who made it. It was possible to get through the Soviet lines in certain areas because there were only a few thousand men in each division. It wasn't a continuous front line, there were holes that potentially individuals or small groups could get through. But then they'd have to go hundreds of kilometers across the frozen steppe and then somehow get through the Soviet front line on the other side. Well, they didn't have the food, fuel or ammunition to do that, so their attempts were doomed from the start. Still, it shows just how unwilling some of the Germans were to give in. Some surrendered, but a lot did not. And that's another important reason why Paulus didn't just wave the white flag. Many who fought on to the end wanted to keep fighting. They wanted to resist. They wanted to fight to the last round, and often did. Some would continue to fight even after organized resistance was done, as we'll find out next time. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.